Hi, I'm Darren and welcome to Level Up Double E Lab. Well, I've been very busy working on my HF transmitter design and I have some interesting updates to share today. So let's take a look. Picking right up from where I left off in episode two, let's look now at the second mixer. I said earlier that I was gonna use all three outputs of the SI5351 as shown on the diagram. One for the balance modulator, the second for the CW carrier injection, and the third for the VFO. That's still my plan, but there's a couple of complications. The first is I cannot carry over the core SI5351 library that I use for the receiver because it only allows two of the three SI5351 outputs to be enabled at any given time. That was a trade-off because of the greatly simplified nature and resulting small size of the code. I can just use the stock Adafruit SI5351 library if my code for the transmitter can accommodate it, which I won't know until I start writing the code. So I'm putting that complication on hold for the time being. A larger issue of concern is potential corruption of the SI5351 output signals. A small but very mighty detail about the SI5351 is it's a CMOS level clock generator which means, among other things, it's designed to source very little current from its outputs. A simple calculation shows that a 50 ohm load connected to the 3.3 volt peak signal output will try to draw about 66 milliamps. The SI5351 is rated for 5.6 milliamps maximum, so that's a problem right there. However, lots of folks, including me, have used the SI5351 to directly drive a 50 ohm diode ring mixer, and it works. So what's the issue? What appears to happen is the output buffers get starved for current, which causes degradation of the output waveform. You still get a fundamental signal on frequency, but you also get a bunch of spurious garbage. And it gets even worse when you have two or more channels enabled. You start getting crosstalk or perhaps even ground bounce effects. So what's the solution? Well, according to what I've read online, it comes down to two paths. Either don't connect the SI5351 to any load lower than about 600 ohms so that you don't exceed the current limit, or add an additional buffer stage that isolates the load from the SI5351. Looking at the balance modulator, that circuit has an input impedance of around 760 ohms according to my simulation, so that should work fine without a buffer stage. But I still need to knock the voltage down to 300 to 500 millivolts peak to peak before feeding it into the MC1496 circuit, and that's easily done by just inserting a Pi network. Using an impedance of 800 ohms, it's straightforward to calculate the 1K and 3.9K values needed. I'll start with these and adjust as needed to get the 300 to 500 millivolt peak to peak input the circuit needs after I build it and test it. Now regarding the other two outputs, one for the CW carrier signal and the other for the second mixer, those have lower input impedances so I'll definitely need to insert buffers. Other folks have had success using buffer inverters from the low voltage CMOS family like the 74LVC1G04. They do seem to offer improvements, but the results don't appear to be dramatically better, so I'm continuing to do research, and I might just end up building my own buffer amplifier. Another thing that confused me about diode ring mixers and Gilbert cell mixers was, does the local oscillator input need to be a sine wave, or could a square wave work just fine? Well, when you look at the physics of what's happening here, in both cases you're trying to either turn on or off something really quickly, either the diodes in the diode ring mixer or the transistors in the Gilbert cell mixer. So as long as the signal strength is high enough to turn the diodes on and off completely and to switch the transistors from cutoff to saturation, either one will work just fine. Now naturally there's more nuances than that when you're working with mixers. Among other things, you never want to overdrive your mixer because if you do, you're going to create strong intermodulation products that'll end up in your output. And even with proper drive and proper design, there's always going to be some IMD products there and you'll need good post-mixer filtering to get rid of them. But for sure, there's no need to obsess over making a spectrally pure sine wave to drive a mixer. All right, back to the circuit diagram. I'm planning on feeding the second mixer with minus 10 dBm from the IF amplifier. 
In a prior episode, I showed that at minus 2 dBm, but on further research, I found guidance in EMRFD that recommends limiting the RF strength to minus 10 dBm for a plus 7 dBm diode ring mixer to avoid distortion and spurious outputs. At any rate, the final 2N3904 in my IF amp has adjustable gain, so I can easily adjust it to minus 10 dBm with plenty of headroom. The ADE-1 has about 5 dB of conversion loss, so that gives me minus 15 dBm coming out. I'm showing a 2 dBm pad between it and the bandpass filters. It's pretty much mandatory when you're using a diode ring mixer to have a good 50 ohm impedance match on the IF port. Otherwise you get reflections and a whole bunch of intermod products. A still better solution would be to use a single stage amplifier instead of that pad. Now I may change that in the future. But at any rate, gotta have bandpass filters ahead of the RF power stages. These filters will be duplicates of those that I made for the simple receiver and I'll devise some sort of switching network for them. Based on the performance data that I collected, I can expect no worse than 3 dB of insertion loss, so that gives me minus 20 dBm going into the preamplifier. And here's where I spent a stupid amount of time chasing various ideas. The goal is straightforward. I want to boost the signal by 47 dB from minus 20 dBm to plus 27 dBm, which will give me the target 500 milliwatts I need to feed into the final power amplifier. The final PA will boost it by a further 17 dB to around 30 watts. If I use a 3 stage preamp, getting 47 dB of gain would require an average of just under 16 dB per stage, which seems reasonable. But I struggled and struggled to find a solution that could get me to that 500 milliwatt target. I kept running into gain compression issues on designs that I tried with minus 20 dBm of input power. Let me show you what I mean. I started with the three-stage preamp used in the transceiver project shown on page 6.80 of EMRFD. It's a good base design that's well documented. Construction uses two 2N3904s and a single 2N3866, all configured as feedback amps. My simple LT Spice AC simulation showed that it has an impressively flat gain curve from 1 MHz through 30 MHz. It only varies from about 42 dB to 45 dB, and is pretty close to my target of 47 dB. But digging deeper, gain compression becomes an issue with a minus 20 dBm input. If you're not familiar with that metric, it's used to quantify the maximum power you can drive an amplifier with before you run into clipping or saturation effects that start creating a nonlinear response. Here's how I found the gain compression issue. I set up a transient simulation with an input sine wave at 14 MHz and at various amplitudes. I then used the measure command to measure the RMS current coming from the source and the RMS voltage at the load. Once I exported that data into a spreadsheet, I was able to calculate the input and output RMS power and compare the two. I then repeated the simulation at various frequencies. So here's the gain compression curves for this amplifier for four different frequencies. The x-axis is input power, and the y-axis is output power. With low levels of input, they plot as a nice one-to-one -one straight line, and only differ in magnitude by the small signal gain. That's the 42 to 45 dB that I mentioned earlier. Where the curves deviate from that straight line and start to flatten out, that indicates that the input power is too much, and nonlinear effects are starting to dominate. The typical rule is to look for a 1 dB drop-off in gain. So for this amp, that occurs right around my target minus 20 dBm input power. It's a little dependent on frequency, but either way, that's not good. It's too close and gives me no headroom. And furthermore, notice that I'm about 4 dB too low for my target of plus 27 dBm output. That's the red dot right here. So that's another problem. Now, this design does include a 6 dB pad between the two N3904 stages, but even dialing it down to just 1 dB only made the problem worse. The gain compression starts kicking in at about minus 25 dBm. What I did next was to break each stage out separately and study it, starting with the third stage, the 2N3866. And right away, it was obvious that this stage was contributing to the problem. Here's what the simulation looks like. You can see the gain compression pretty much matches the plus 23 dBm limit of the three full stages. So if I was going to make this amplifier work for me, I've got to do something about this 2N3866 stage. 
I spent considerable time playing around with that 2N3866 stage and the two 2N3904 stages ahead of it, but nothing I did could get rid of that gain compression issue nor boost the overall power to where I needed it. I tried changing the feedback networks per the formulas in EMRFD. I tried changing the biasing of each transistor. I even reconfigured the output transformer of the 2N3866 to drop the collector load resistance, but none of that got me to the 500 milliwatts of output power with minus 20 dBm of input. And I've not yet mentioned the biggest headache of all of trying to build an amplifier with a 2N3866. Here in 2022, all the original and secondary high volume manufacturers have discontinued it, so it's only available as new old stock or dicey Chinese knockoffs. So even if I did solve this issue, I was still troubled by the fact that my design would still be functionally obsolete. We hobbyists can easily lose track of the fact that the parts that we enjoy using in our designs are only there because somebody bigger than us is consuming them in the millions of units. And when that demand dries up because of technology shifts or other trends, we're out of luck. So with all those issues in mind, I decided to modify the EMRFD design as shown here. The biggest change was I dumped the 2N3866 in favor of an IRF510 MOSFET. The circuit I'm showing comes from page 2.36 in EMRFD, but this configuration using an IRF510 as an RF amplifier is pretty commonly used in hobbyist work. Now a nice thing about the 510 and its many other IRF cousins in 2022 is they're still in active production and they're not very expensive. Even though it's intended for switching applications, there's plenty of practical HF amplifiers that have used it. It's also easier to figure out the biasing for a MOSFET than for a BJT. For now, I've got it set pretty high at 114 milliamps, which puts it solidly into Class A operation. I've also modified the second stage to use a 2N2222 instead of the 2N3904, mostly because I boosted the bias current from 16 milliamps to 33 milliamps to get more gain. Lastly, I played around with the two emitter degradation caps on the first two stages for reasons I'll cover in a moment. And here's what the gain response looks like in a simple AC simulation. It's definitely not as flat as the base EMRFD amplifier, which I'm showing here plotted to the same scale. That's mostly because the IRF510 is not feedback biased, so its gain is much higher at lower frequencies than it is at higher frequencies. I partially compensated for that effect by fiddling with the two degradation caps that I mentioned earlier, but it's still not as flat as I'd like it. But the big upside is, this design fixes both my gain compression issue and my output power issue. Here's what the simulation results look like as compared to the base design. I can easily drive this baby with my minus 20 dBm input and not hit gain compression until I drive it with almost minus 15 dBm, so that's good. And for the 40 meter and 20 meter bands, I've got at least plus 27 dBm output power. Look here how the gain rolls off with increasing frequency, much more so than the base design. Now I've got some headroom with adjusting those two caps to even it out some more, plus I've got other items that I can twiddle, like the pad between the first two stages and possibly adding some feedback to the IRF510 that can help flatten out the performance but I think that level of tweaking is better saved for actual hardware and not in simulation. So that's where I am on my HF transmitter design, and for sure I'd rather have this problem where I've got a stage that's too powerful and trying to dial it down rather than the problem I was struggling with for weeks of trying to take a weaker one and boost it up. I also need to state the obvious of just how useful LT Spice has been with this project. At this point, I've literally run over 100 different simulations and what-if analyses to try out various ideas to try to get the performance that I want. And I've learned a lot about how these feedback amplifiers work along the way. Now I've commented in earlier videos that there's a good balance between analytical engineering and empirical engineering, and in this case trying to do all this work on the breadboard would have been a lot longer and a lot more frustrating, so this particular instance was definitely well suited for spice simulations. I do hope you're enjoying these technically heavy episodes I'm creating on this project. They're definitely quite a bit different than the repair work I'm doing in my HW101 or in my AV3 meter, but it's just part of the stuff that I'm very interested in, and I hope you are too. So as always, thanks very much for watching, and until next time, bye for now.